This is the Play Your Position podcast, where we huddle up, call the plays, and inspire you to run your ball into the end zone. Are you ready to score more game-winning touchdowns in your life, business, and career? Then listen up, because it's game time, baby. Now, here's your host, Mary Lou Kayser. Are robots coming for our jobs? This is a question that people have been asking for several decades. It may seem like this question is new, but technology has been with us for a lot longer than we give it credit for and, you know, that we remember. Whatever's newest and most unfamiliar becomes what we focus on. It's easy to overlook the fact that the conversation around automation and technology has been going on for a long time. Today, the talk is about artificial intelligence. I'm sure you've been hearing the buzz. And it's not that AI is a new topic. It's simply that the speed at which new AI tools are entering our daily lives has increased exponentially. The topic of AI has come up recently in conversations with guests here on PYP. Questions like, what role will AI play in how we work and live moving forward? How will it free up or steal our time? Will certain jobs disappear? And I want to quickly address these three questions before getting into the heart of today's episode. Question number one, what role will AI play in how we work and live moving forward? Well, it's ever-changing. For those of us who use Siri or Alexa, AI is already embedded in our lives. And I'm sure there's plenty of other examples. Those are the two that came top of mind. And they've been around for a bit. They have not just suddenly appeared. Question number two, how will AI free up or steal our time? Well, it's a matter of personal choice. Certain AI apps like Siri or Alexa can save us time once we learn how to use them correctly. Other AI apps can take us down rabbit holes, stealing time we can never get back. So again, self-awareness is critical here. And question number three, will certain jobs disappear? Well, of course, certain jobs will disappear. That isn't anything new. You look back 100 years ago, the way the world was then, and there were jobs in the 1920s that no longer exist in the 2020s. The same will be true 10, 50, 100 years from now. That's progress. And that's good. So what is all the fuss about AI? Something I've been thinking about recently is AI and being a writer. Like thousands of other writers, I paid attention back in November of 2022 when an app called ChatGPT made its big splash on the world stage. I think you have to be living under a rock not to know that this tool now exists. And it's not the first artificial intelligence tool to come out on the market to help with writing and generating content, but it's the one that's gotten the most attention. If you play on LinkedIn like I do, you'll see posts almost daily talking about chat GPT, everything from, hey, I created this entire post using chat GPT, what do you think? To the other extreme where people are saying, We need to ban it from the schools. It's going to interfere with children's ability to develop critical thinking skills, et cetera, and so forth, right? I've been using an AI tool for generating written content for several years. I want to say at least three. It could be longer, but I don't use it a lot. Every now and then I pop in some ideas and then see what pops back out to me. The thing about good writing One of the hallmarks of really good writing, writing that's memorable, writing that touches the soul or the heart or both, writing that makes an impact is something called voice. Voice is that distinctive quality related to its creator. Now, everyone has a voice, certainly. In the creative world, artists of all kinds have voices. We are drawn to different creators because of their voice, ultimately. There's something about them. Sometimes we can't identify what that something is. We just know we resonate. 
And sometimes it's really obvious. So St Steven Spielberg, for example, he's a movie maker, a filmmaker. He has a voice. You see something made by him. There's a sense about the film that this was made by Steven Spielberg. If you go to an art museum, like I did a couple of weeks ago, I was in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. I was looking at paintings and sculptures. Now, Picasso is a Picasso because he had a voice through how and what he painted. Musicians, poets, dancers, playwrights, actors, athletes even, you could say Michael Jordan, Dennis Rodman, Serena Williams, uh, Patrick Mahomes, Tom Brady certainly, all have voices. There's something distinctive about the way they show up, even if they're operating, and they all are, operating within a large category like athletics, like art, like music, right? Look at the popularity of the television show, The Voice. Why do so many people tune in to watch shows like that? Because at the end of the day, we appreciate authenticity. We want to be a witness to and experience something real. We want to be a witness to what makes humans human. Can you imagine if a show like The Voice featured contestants who were merely lip syncing artificially intelligence generated music? Ugh right? It, it, it would, might be a novelty for a season, but it wouldn't last. In the podcasting space, what makes a show memorable, what makes an audience continue to come back is certainly the overall content and the theme of the show, but the voice is also important. That thing that distinguishes it from everything else. Sometimes it's the literal voice, like my voice now that you're listening to, that captures attention. Sometimes it's the essence of the program where there might be multiple voices, say a show like This American Life. Certainly when I'm interviewing someone, you're not just hearing my voice, but you're hearing another person's voice too. And together in conversation, we're creating a third voice. And there's a sense about it, a flavor, an expectation that is developed and a whole cadre of emotions associated with the experience, everything from feeling comfortable, feeling engaged, feeling inspired, laughing, maybe crying, perhaps even move to take action in a certain direction of your life. All things that are created have a voice. They have a distinction, something that makes them different from everybody else. Artificial intelligence is cool for sure. It's definitely fun to play around with the different apps like chat GBT for generating written content and Lenza AI, which I talked about in a previous Audible on this show. And that's an app which generates avatars of your selfies in a variety of predefined styles. These variations of who you are are fascinating. But as far as writing goes, here's the thing that most people aren't talking about. Here's the thing most people aren't talking about. Basically, when you use an artificial intelligence app to generate written content, what it generates is limited to what already exists on the internet. In other words, it's not making up something original in its AI brain. It can only compile variations of what already exists. Now, some people may argue that humans do the same thing, that there is nothing original, right? I want to attribute that back to Shakespeare. It could have gone farther back than that. But there really is no originality, that things are variations of what already exists. But let me, let me take it a little bit deeper in, in relation to AI, because I do have a point here that I think is worthy of us really thinking about at this point in the AI journey. In a very simplified way, how these apps work is you open them up, then you can ask a series of questions or import certain content, like with Lens AI, you would import selfies. But I want to focus on writing right now. And inside this app, there may be some pre-designated styles, like you want to write a blog post in the style of Ernest Hemingway, for example, or you want to create a Facebook ad, or you want to generate a series of headlines that you might use in a marketing campaign. Okay, these this is nice to have tools that can help with this, right? You type in some keywords, you type in some ideas, and then it will scour the internet 
and bring back to you three, sometimes five or however many variations you've designated you want to see. Then you can review them and use the ones you like. Now here's where the distinction is made. Lazy writers will simply copy and paste what the app generates. They won't spend any time reading it, thinking about it, reviewing it. Really good writers, on the other hand, conscientious writers, take what's generated and then will put their own spin on that content. They will give it their voice. What AI generates feels and sounds flat. AI content lacks voice. Now, AI can be a great way to brainstorm, get some good baselines to start a writing project. The danger is if people are just taking what is spit back to them without working through fact checking, without working through, hmm, does this really make sense? Without making it their own by giving it voice. That's setting yourself up for some trouble. Maybe not right away, but possibly down the road if you simply copy and paste what the app gives you. The negative consequences might not be immediate. And you know, there's probably people out there that are getting away with it now. But there are ethical questions around plagiarism and also mistakes, not to mention boring writing. Case in point, I was listening to a podcast interview with a man who did very, very well in Silicon Valley. He's exited numerous companies and is a bazillionaire. Now he's putting his time and money into some of these AI tools and companies that are working 24 seven to develop them. And he decided to take chat GPT for a ride, asking it to generate a bio about him that might be read at a conference. What the app created was loaded with mistakes. The copy claimed he had a degree from Oxford University, which he does not. It also said that he had formed a specific company, which he had not. And there were other mistakes as well. Those are just some surface level examples. So I decided to try this experiment for myself using my name to generate a bio for me. So I signed up for a free account in chat GPT. I gave it the following command write a bio for Mary Lou Kayser. Then I literally watched it compose a 200 word bio of me just right in front of me on the screen. Some of it is accurate, but several key points are 100% false. I'm not going to read the whole thing right now. I'm just going to give you the highlights. Again, for example, it says that I earned a bachelor of science uh, degree in journalism from the University of Kansas. Nope, I did not. And also said I wrote a book about leadership and jazzercise, also incorrect. Now, there is a book about leadership and jazzercise. You can look it up on Amazon, but I didn't write it. Now, if I was relying on someone to generate content for me and they used this tool and say I was going to be presenting at a conference and they sent this copy off to the organizers of the conference and, you know, sometimes I I get that we're supposed to check everything before it goes out. We all know that sometimes we get busy. And if you're delegating certain tasks to a team, this is something that might be missed. And if you delegate a task to somebody and they're going to use these tools, um, here's where my point comes in. You better check to make sure that what is generated is accurate, because if it becomes publicly shared, you might not only be embarrassed, but you could lose a lot of credibility, um, which could lead to some you know, in in a worst case scenario, lawsuits, right? Or losing your company or, I mean, it could just get ugly, right? So yeah, um, fascinating to watch not only the, the, uh, the, the tool create in front of me, but to read it and say, no, not, not accurate. Now, ChatGPT, like a lot of these um, apps, gives you the option of regenerating a different response. And so I ran it a second time just to see what came out. And more things about me came out that weren't true. Now, there was some stuff in there that was accurate, okay? So I'm not saying the whole thing was wrong, but I'm saying that as a unit, if someone were to just copy and paste that and said, here's a bio of Mary Lou Kayser, it wasn't, it wasn't accurate. Um One thing I did notice is the app does have a warning on its dashboard that reads, 
limitations may occasionally generate incorrect information. So they're covering their ass here. Um, they realize that there are limitations to these tools. And here's the thing, like any tool, AI is only as good as its user, right? So for people who are thinking, oh, you know, I can just dictate something and AI is going to do all the work for me. Dangerous thinking. That is dangerous thinking. You might get away with it for a while, but eventually people are going to catch on. And the other key point here we need to pay attention to is this. What's essentially being generated with these tools are copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. You might remember what copies of copies of copies look like if you are a certain age. You might remember, for example, back in the day when you were in elementary school or middle school or high school even, before we had print on demand and computers and stuff, that's what teachers would do with the handouts. They would make copies of copies of copies. And it could reach the point where what happened to the original became so faded, you couldn't even read the damn thing. I can remember this distinctly and the teachers sheepishly, oh, you know, we're just doing the best we can. I, I had this file from way back and it's a copy of a copy of a copy. Well, the same thing begins to happen when you are pulling content from a limited pool. Granted, the limited pool of content on the internet is enormous, but it is limited. We are already seeing copies of copies of copies and it's only going to get worse. So think about this. Before these these AI tools came along, humans were entering original content onto the internet. Now we're at a point where content that is being generated and added to the internet, a portion of it is generated by artificial intelligence, which has created this new content, air quote, new content from what already exists. And so you're starting to get this snowball effect of repetitiveness and a same old, same old, and again, going back to my point earlier, flat, boring, uninteresting, lacking voice. This at some point is going to reach a saturation point if it hasn't already. That was another point that was brought up in the interview I mentioned about the man who took chat GPT for a ride with his bio. He said the amount of information that the tools can scour to create new content is by its nature limited. We're already running out of where to go get content. There's only so much written about, let's say the band Led Zeppelin, right? Or Steve Jobs and the iPhone. The question of course for all of us is, is this what we want? Is this what we want for our content? Do we want AI generated content, whether it's words or images or sounds, and perhaps someday it'll be video, do we want that representing who we are? If you're in a business that requires content generation, I get it. It's a big job. It can be a tedious job. The demand for content is insatiable. I've been talking about that for years. When I first got into content marketing 10 years ago, specifically, I was like, whoa, the content marketing monster is insatiable. No matter how much you feed it, it's still wants and demands more. So of course, a tool that promises to punch out content that you can simply copy and paste into your social feed or on your website, it's alluring. It is cool to be able to generate a long form post using a tool that doesn't require as much brain power or time as sitting in front of a blank page and coming up with something original all on your own. Again, I get the time issue. I get the efficiency issue. But ultimately, we each have to ask ourselves, is our brand, our reputation, the kind of work that we do worth a copy of a copy of a copy? Or do we learn how to use these tools in a way so that what we do generate has that sense of an original voice and a sense of oh, that's different, that's new, that's cool, that's thought-provoking, that doesn't sound like everything else. This conversation about AI is just getting started. I believe we need to be actively talking about technology and tools that become available so that we can make intelligent decisions and not get sucked into something that is either going to take time away from what really matters or we get into something and then find ourselves over our heads and have to try to scramble to get out of the cesspool. Again, if you're going to swim, 
you have to jump into the pool eventually. Keep in mind what else is in that pool and what are some of the conditions that you can expect to find in it. Because the crawl may not be the best stroke in that pool. You may need to do the butterfly. You may need to do the backstroke. You may need to do the doggy paddle. You may need to be able to hold your breath underwater for a little bit longer than normal. Perhaps this episode is bringing awareness to something that you haven't really thought about before. And that's a good thing because chances are good there are people in your life who right now are trying these tools, who are using these tools, who know about these tools, and they're only going to become more ingrained in daily life as we move forward. That's progress. And it really is, well, it's all part of where we're headed collectively. You know, I'm an original, not a copy of a copy. I like originality. I'm attracted to origina- originality. That's where I stand on this. Tools are great, but they can only get us so far. At the end of the day, if you can learn how to use your creative juices, use your brain power, be a critical thinker, you will have a more exceptional life than those who don't develop those skills. I will go to my grave believing that. Here at Play Your Position, I'm all about original conversations, about deep conversations and asking big questions so that we can live more meaningful, rewarding, and fulfilling lives. I think there's room in that equation for AI. As long as we're paying attention to what it's doing, why we're using it, and how it's being used. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of the Play Your Position podcast. Remember, team, it is always a great day to get out there and play your position. I hope today's episode inspired you to think a little bit differently about what's happening right now all around us. This is Mary Lou Kayser. We will catch you next time. Here at the Play Your Position podcast, we believe that the road to self-mastery and a life well-lived starts with answering the call to leadership. That's when the fun really begins. Send this episode to any friends who might need to hear the inspiration and ideas you heard today. And feel free to rate and review us on your favorite podcast platform. 